have our speakers left? I'm just kind of re queued up on Brown. All right. Okay, now we're ready to go to our final closing talk. Let's see if we have our speakers first. We have uh, Carly Peters and Jim Head in two different locations. Uh, so uh, we'll start with Carly, I believe, and then we're going to move over to Jim. They're going to talk to us about the importance of continued lunar exploration. And we selected them because we know that they will leave us with the, the kind of enthusiastic, upbeat feeling that uh, we always get when we talk to them. So, so we're looking forward to this talk. And let's just see. We're a few Carly, minutes. are you there? I think yeah, so. There we go. I think, I think we're All ready. Right, All right, great. And Carly, I think you're in New Mexico, is that right? Hi, you can see the Vegas? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you so much for being here with us today to do this. And uh, you've had such an important role in putting together the, uh, the program. You were on the SOC, and we really appreciated that. And of course, you've led one of our NLSI uh, teams, and, and we've just been thrilled with that as well. So thank you and Jim both for giving this talk today. Well, thank you for, for uh, uh, providing this opportunity. The, the la I must say, the last few days have been absolutely phenomenal. Um, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I've learned a lot. I've got lots of notes, lots of questions. Um, it, it's a little um, humbling to be part of the last talk of this uh, couple of days. Um, there's no way in, in the 20 minutes or so that we can really capture it all. But at least we can maybe stir the pot a little and 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 have let the discussion continue. Um, I particularly like this uh, um, slide that we're using to to open this discussion. It, it's as the caption says uh, from the International Space Station, looking at the moon, and it really highlights the, or reminds us of the mysteries of the moon that still remain. So let's go on. Uh, these are the topics that Jim and I are going to talk about. I'll talk about the first few and then pass it over to Jim, and he'll uh, uh, carry it towards the future as well. Um, OK, starting with sort of where we are now, um, uh, up at the top of the screen is a figure that I took from the uh, LPI MLSI site that really captures the various missions that have been flown to the moon. Um, and it has a little symbol for each one of them. Um, I should note this is not a linear time scale, and in particular between the cluster at Apollo and the cluster where we are now, which is the little arrow, is a generational gap. Um, so it's, it's, it's decades in between there. Um, and what I'm doing here, and I'll do throughout the first part of this talk, is classify the missions according to what kind of type they are. And for the group of missions that we've been discussing for the last several days and the results from it, most of them, with the exception of LCOS, have been orbital with a variety of really first class instruments uh, and results from, from, from uh, uh, these systems. Um, it should be obvious to everyone, although I haven't put little um, uh, notations on there, that this is an extremely international group. Um, uh, in fact, um, the first three are from uh, Japan, China, and India. India, uh, and of course, LRO and Artemis is uh, from uh, the US and, and Grail. Um, so really, the international activities of this phase of lunar exploration is absolutely phenomenal. Um, at the, uh, in a moment, I'll be talking about the planned missions in this context as well. But let's, let's move forward to look at some of the questions and results that we've been discussing over the last several days. There's been a phenomenal amount of discoveries. There's no way I can capture or highlight them all. So of course, I'm going to use some of my own perspectives on this and highlight some of the ones that are my favorites. Um, um, and I'll walk through several of these, giving examples of, uh, uh, in a moment. The one that I'm not going to do is the last bullet, um, in that there, there's no way I can actually capture this. But this is one I know that motivates a lot of us, uh, which really brings in the Earth-Moon history se sequence um, that clearly has been 
um, uh, uh, carried forward by a lot of, of the integrated data from the various orbiters that we've been received, coupled, coupled to uh, a very serious modeling and integration of these data. I think this is one of the most important aspects of lunar science, namely that this is the one habitable zone that we do know, and the moon is the best place to really get the historical record and understand the characteristics uh, of, of that sequence. So let's move forward to some other examples. Uh, obviously, the water is uh, uh, one that has been on uh, everyone's mind for uh, several years now. There's been workshop, a couple of workshops, uh, special sessions at various conferences, including this one. And, and, and one of the things that, is, that we certainly didn't know at the beginning of all of this, that there's not only water on the moon, there's three kinds of water. There is the interior, the ancient primordial water that is part of the moon from the very beginning. And obviously, that comes from analyses of the lunar samples with the, the wonderful kinds of instruments that are available now that weren't available you know, 40 years ago. Uh, the second kind is the surficial, which is ongoing. It's recent. It's coupled with the space environment. Um, and the third, of course, is the buried or sequestered uh, components that uh, we believe are in the polar areas but have been very evasive um, and clearly need a lot of work to try to understand uh, some of their characteristics. And we'll come back to some of the remaining questions, of which there are many at the end. Um, oops, I'm hitting the wrong button. Uh, OK. Uh, the lunar interior. Um, we, we've heard several, especially with the excitement from GRAIL of some of the new uh, phenomena that we're understanding about the interior of the moon. But there's a lot of additional data, some of which we just heard uh, a few um, uh, hours ago, um, about, about um, uh, the lunar interior that's really based on analysis of the lunar samples with current instrumentation. Um, we've confirmed that the lunar core exists. We've confirmed that there was a lunar dynamo, and it has been dated. Um, now, not all, the not all the answers are there, but we have had a lunar dynamo. And we do know something about when it occurred. This is really extremely important. Um, the crustal structure, there's features in the crustal structure that Grail has found that no one even guessed at. Um, one of my favorites are the details. And the example I show here is, is an area on the edge, excuse me, at uh, Ingeny and South Pole Aiken, which we didn't have before GRAIL. We, we simply did not have this information for the far side of the moon. And Ingeny has a little mass con right in the middle of it, which is going to be very important. OK, let me, before my enthusiasm gets carried away. Um, changing scale, uh, looking it up close, all the incredible information that has come first from the Kagea high resolution data and now from the NAC camera has been phenomenal. These holes or pits where we've had collapses into voids on, in, in basaltic material. There are layered blocks that, that NAC has found. Um, uh, how layers occurred, what scale is, is uh, we haven't even addressed that yet. The uh, uh, documentation of both the Apollo um, uh, landings and the Luna 24 which really um, uh, answered a lot of questions that we had about the character of the Luna 24 samples. As you can see there, it's a nice little lander right on the edge of a crater. That crater has been shown to be a secondary from Giordano Bruno. Wonderful story. And of course, the recent data that we heard about, uh, about identifying new craters on the moon with LRO um, is, is very exciting and opens a whole set of additional questions. Uh, moving on, um, one of my own favorites, of course, is the new compositions that have been identified. And these are new compositions. We, we haven't looked at them before, um, and we're searching through the lunar samples to find them, one of which is this pure anorthosite. And when, when we say pure, we mean pure. There's less than 2% matrix. This is pioneered by the uh, Kagia team, Otaki et al. Um, principally with a paper in 2009 at Jackson Crater, has been continued on by several groups. There's the recent paper that's going to be coming out in JGR for Oriental by Cheek et al. that identifies 
in just the inner Rook Mountains, the inner ring of Oriental is concentrated this pure anorthosite. Um, and that's quite different from the fan, which has higher abundance of matrix components. Uh, second is the Creek Highland volcanism. Um, the, the Compton Belkovich, and we've heard in this session there are probably others that are, are equally interesting. Uh, this is something that we have not found uh, before, but which is um, uh, brand new in terms of composition. And of course, there's the magnesium spinel, which was discussed earlier, and which I was pleased to see one of the posters were, were uh, selected uh, on this particular topic. Um, uh, and here's where this, this uh, engine um, um, uh, MassCon, uh, because the, the, the spinel uh, uh, in South Wallachian is, is associated with uh, the, Jack, the, the Thompson crater within Ingenie. OK. Oh, and last, um, of course, there's lots of integration. The, the permanently shadowed areas, I'm, I'm using this example from the wonderful Lola topography and the kind of resolution that it's seen with some wonderful TC data looking at scattered light. And you see essentially the same internal capabilities. Uh, we heard earlier from the NAC team that they've been carrying this concept to other uh, permanently shadowed areas. Um, uh, none of them have found any high albedo material that would indicate surficial frost. And in fact, and this is really a delightful convergence of multiple uh, issues, um, that, that the uh, Kagia team has recently been able to look at the illuminated portion and identify that the composition of the illuminated portion is, in fact, this pan, this pure anorthosite. So it's a wonderful example of some of the really brightness that the uh, um, uh, laser altimeter has been able to detect for this crater. Um, but also, it, it, it's, a, it's a note that if people want to go and land there, what you're going to find is an orthocyte. You're not going to find the basic components of South Pole Lake Basin. Keep that in mind. Um, OK. Um, yeah, now, what I've walked through is some of, some, just a tiny bit of the exciting things that have been going on over the last several years. Um, but as Jim sort of alluded to in one of his presentations earlier in this conference, Yes, we've been there, but we have not done that. There's enormous amounts of questions that have not been addressed. And I've listed some here, and I want to walk through what some of these uh, imply in terms of how we need to go about uh, evaluating them. These are the same questions, but now I've also included the kinds of approaches that is needed to address some of these. The first is, where are volatiles? What is the concentration of volatiles on the moon? What is the abundance? What is the origin? Are some of them renewable? Um, we need additional uh, orbital data to address this. We need it in global sense. We obviously need a series of soft landers to address this. Uh, this is a very important integrated question, not only for the moon, but for the whole uh, airless bodies uh, in, in solar system science. Um, Going to the opposite scale, what is the internal structure of this differentiated body and what planetary processes created them? This is fundamental um, for planetary science. This is fundamental. When did these occur? How did they occur? This is what we need is the integrated um, 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 network of, of seismic uh, 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 sequences across the moon. We also clearly need sample return to, to sample individual components. Um, what are the properties of particular unique environments? I could spend another hour on these. There's the permanently shadowed areas. There's dust, rock, how they interact. There's the swirls and the magnetic anomalies associated with them. There's these young vents, which haven't been um, discussed much here, but which now we've seen several of them across the surface of the moon. There's these deep holes. Clearly, um, additional information from orbital information as well as soft landers to target these areas are open a whole set of questions that the moon uh, is waiting for us. Um, what type of rock types have yet to be discovered? Um, we, I just alluded to some that we had no ideas before. There's clearly more. Um, we can do a lot more from orbit with, with the sophisticated instruments that are now available. 
oh, clearly we need to target some of these areas that we've identified as having some unique compositions with sample return. We've got a long list of, of, of places that will really uh, enormously expand our understanding of the character and evolution of the moon uh, in that regard. Uh, what is the impact history at 1AU, starting with what Bill Hartman, uh, it, the questions he raised at the beginning of this conference to now, uh, clearly we need uh, additional information to really address these. Sample return is highest among these. And of course, when were soil and dust particles formed? How do they interact in the space environment and with foreign objects? These are really very important questions, not only for the scientific end of it, but for, for uh, future exploration of any airless body. OK, uh, what does, where are we going from here? Well, here's the planned mission. We have LADI uh, that's going to be launched shortly. Uh, we have the Changi uh, lander in Sinus Iridum, uh, which is planned to be uh, l uh, launched and landed this year. We have the XPRIZE. I didn't know if that's going to be a hard lander or a soft lander. It could be either one. Um, and then we have continued um, exploration uh, by both the Russians and the Indians with the Luna 25, 26, 27, and Chandrayaan 2. Um, and we all know that the uh, Chang'e 5, which is uh, currently uh, designated for 2017, um, is currently the, possibly the first sample return for the moon um, in the near future. So let's look at these planned missions relative to the questions that I just asked. Uh, here, are some of, here are the questions again. And which of these missions that are on the dock now uh, and that are going to happen um, are, are going to address uh, these issues? Well, if you sort of walk through them, I think really it's the last one that is the best, namely that, that, that the last one, Laddie, is specifically designed to address. But most of the others, really, we have a long ways to go. And I think with that, I'll pass it over to Jim and let him talk about some of the historical factors and the, the turning forward. OK, thank you very much, Carly. Uh, I'm going to have to crank this up to 11 botkeys, but that's OK. So a really critical question is, <laughs> <laughs> Is it not going? OK. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> so a, a critical question here is, how can we combine uh, lunar, human, and robotic exploration? And I think this is really critical, because all the things that Carly outlined really had a lot to do with, in fact, robotic exploration. And yet we know uh, we can be successful in human exploration, and it offers us a huge array of things that we need to think about and explore in the future. So let's just take a quick look at a historical perspective on this and ask the question, what was accomplished during Apollo? So I think when most of us think about Apollo, we think about boots on the ground. Uh, and field geology. And indeed, we collected uh, almost uh, 2,200 samples and 382 kilograms of rocks and explored their context. You can see the astronauts, Dave Scott in the lower left, uh, looking at the base of the Hadley uh, Delta Mountain, uh, John Young doing a gravity experiment at Apollo 16, and indeed, uh, Jack Schmidt uh, really working over a boulder at the Apollo 17 site. But this is only one of many activities in Apollo. I think it's really important to learn. For example, if you look to the right of John Young's leg, you can see in the background a Lyman Alpha uh, experiment, which was actually uh, uh, indeed uh, science from the moon. So this was, in fact, looking outside the moon with an observatory, a, a telescope, if you will. Uh, and this illustrates that it was not just science on the moon, but it was science of the moon, around the moon, and from the moon. So let's just take a quick look at the kinds of things that happened during Apollo. Starting in the upper left, it's definitely boots on the ground. But remember that the traverses were over 100 kilometers on Apollo, and in Lunica did another 52 and a half kilometers. And you can see in the right the ALSEP, the uh, essentially lunar ejecta and meteorite experiment, things like passive seismometry, active seismometry. Imagine this. Uh, the Apollo 14 astronauts put out a seismic line and a Gatling gun uh, to actually do an active seismic experiment. And two missions put mortars on the surface, and uh, 2.5 uh, kilograms of explosives were, uh, in fact, fired and detonated uh, to, in fact, show what the st structure of the, of the surface was. And so these are really amazing things. Explosive charges, 
heat flow measurements, regolith drill cores. You can see in the bottom traverse gravimeters. Uh, in fact, there was a whole heat uh, series of, um, uh, of uh, surface electro properties experiments shown in the lower right. Uh, in the lower left, you can see a full SIMBE, a scientific instrumentation module, which had dozens of experiments over the history of Apollo. And in fact, just above that, you can see that one of them was, in fact, a, uh, a uh, active radar sounding experiment, which in fact probed uh, the subsurface of the moon. So there were dozens and dozens of things. And we even used, if you can see in the middle there to the left, the Saturn 4B, just after the lunar module had been pulled out by the command module in Earth orbit, that was then targeted to the lunar surface to create an impact which provided energy, which the seismometers could detect, to understand the internal structure. The ascent stage of the lunar module was used in the same way. And both of these can be used in that way again. And also, uh, as we heard during the conference, to uh, look at places where we might be able to impact and eject volatiles from the subsurface. So in fact, uh, Apollo is really pretty amazing. And uh, it's really important to think about this, because all of this took place in the context of these types of experiments. And if we take a look back at all these missions, there were six of them. Uh, it looked at the exosphere, the interior, the exterior, et cetera. There were six missions, science on the moon, science of the moon, around the moon, and from the moon. Well, can we do this again? We described this earlier in a talk I gave a couple of days ago. Uh, it, not with a top-down approach like Constellation, necessarily, uh, but with a bottom-up approach. It's the kind of thing I described. Take the excess, successful Apollo architecture and 40 years of technology development, and then re-engineer Apollo. And in fact, this is what we did. And uh, in uh, our Brown MIT Lunar Science Institute activity, that was one of the major activities, we essentially had students get together, set scientific objectives, and then redesign Apollo with updated capabilities. You can see there Sasha Bazileski representing the Lunacod and, and Russian experience, Jeff Hoffman, the five-time shuttle astronaut, on the right, Dave Scott, the Apollo 15 commander, and an unidentified uh, student in the middle there somewhere. OK, so what we did was we did things like uh, do design reference missions to Copernicus uh, to take advantage of all the great data we had, including exploration geophysics, uh, sample return, all sorts of things like this. And in fact, we were able to, in these design reference missions, see that we could increase the capability immensely. Now, I just put this slide in for the record, but let me point out that um, not only were we able to increase down mass, increase bandwidth, recover 60% of the uh, power, get new technology from forklift applications, for crying out loud. Lots of applications in mines have increased our capabilities in carbon fiber it's for cells and things like that. And we updated to 56% of the original lunar module mass. Not only that, in this descent here, which I showed you just in the previous slide, we were able to create an impact downrange accessible uh, to, in fact, the astronauts after they had landed. And so we created an experiment which we could actually go visit at each of the landing sites to look at this kind of capability. So this is really an important message for us in terms of the ability to um, utilize human exploration and human robotic exploration. So what's the vision for the future? We really need to look to history. And it's not just thinking about Apollo. It's thinking about how exploration works. It doesn't happen overnight. Sometimes there are hiatuses. Sometimes there are surges. But it just simply doesn't happen overnight. So we can look at the past successes and try to plan for the future. We need to continue dedication and perseverance. And perseverance is completely clear, OK? If you don't have perseverance, you're not going to get to your goal in anything in life. So we have amazing, amazing sets of data, multiple fundamental scientific problems and questions, as Carly's pointed out. And we really need to continue developing a bottom-up approach until a top-down approach or the funding comes along. We need to define a legacy. I think this is really critical. And Carly touched on this for sure when she mentioned, in fact, uh, for example, that the Earth is a witness plate to early Earth history. I'm sorry, the Moon is a witness plate to early Earth history. And we need to try to understand evolution uh, in uh, the habitable zone. I think that's a really good legacy. That's, that's a focus for us all. We need to build science and engineering synergism, as we discussed. Engage and cultivate engineers to make our scientific dreams a reality. Just think about that. Believe me, believe me, engineers would much rather do something that's critically important than just simply send a sandbag into lunar orbit. Trust me on that. They're excited about this. Once you engage them, and then they'll let you set the requirements. They'll say, well, what do you need to do? How can we help? Global access, long stay times, maximum traverse range, up mass, down mass, increase it, OK? We were able to do that in the Apollo program. 
communications, infrastructure. Uh, this is critical too. Dave Kring mentioned this today. You know, we have spacecraft in orbit in, around Earth today that provide huge communications infrastructure. It's trivial to do for the moon. We should be thinking about this in an integrated way, not just a one-off communications with each satellite. And we need human robotic partnerships, as I hope I showed with Apollo and what it was able to accomplish. We can surely do this in the future, even enhancing it much, much more. We need to undertake design reference missions. This is an activity that brings real uh, soberness, if you will, to, in fact, understanding what you can do with these capabilities and challenges the engineers as well. Encourage international cooperation and encourage the present and future uh, generations of students. You know, I mean, I was able to participate in Apollo as my first job out of grad school because a lot of people had done a lot of work. And I hope that, in fact, the work we're doing now will enable future generations of students as well as the present generations of students to actually get these things going. I would encourage you to support and develop advocacy groups like League, like uh, SBAG and MPAG, M MEPAG, okay, and also undertake uh, and utilize fertile environments like the NLSI survey uh, and create new environments like these as well. I can't underline enough the capabilities, the communications, the diversity of backgrounds. Honestly, it's just like Apollo where it was a hugely diverse community. And this is what really energizes and optimizes human robotic exploration and really does the job in terms of reaching out, as NASA goal, NASA's goal is, into the solar system uh, to return fundamental scientific information with human robotic uh, exploration. So the bottom line here is I think we need to uh, think about the following things. We have a very large number of the ingredients that are already in place. This is really amazing. A huge number of ingredients are just sitting there waiting. Okay, We have data. We have significant questions. We have historical experience. We surely have motivation. And we surely have interest. We have a strong international interest in exploration, not only of the moon, but other planetary bodies as well. And indeed, we have synergistic human robotic exploration of the moon. Uh, that we've shown is totally feasible. It's totally feasible. We can redesign, uh, take the Apollo architecture, and really do some fundamental things that will enhance that at costs which are much less than people consider, say, for constellation and other capabilities. So it's not a question if humans go back to the moon and then onto asteroids and beyond, but when. So I really encourage you to think about the fact that all the seeds are there. It's up to the current generation of students and young researchers to plant the seeds wisely, nurture and really cultivate them, and create new opportunities with your national and international partners. Because you also need to bond with the engineers and make them part of the team and then reap the harvest. And so to all you students out there and young investigators in the forum, forum maybe may you be as lucky as I was and have your own Apollo. I really hope you can go out and make it so, OK? So in closing, I'd like to give my sincere thanks to the leadership of NASA, headquarters, John Grunsfeld, Jim Green, uh, and Bill Gersenmeyer and Mike Wargo, the combination of those two uh, directors has been really, really amazing. And it's an unbelievably unique thing that I haven't seen work well since Apollo. And with survey, it's going to work well into the future. And Yvonne Pendleton and the NLSI leadership at NLSI Central, thanks so much for making all of this possible. Thanks. I'll take some questions. Thank you. Oh, that was fabulous. Thank you very much. We really appreciate it. What a great close. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we have a couple of questions for you that came in the chat box. So I'll take one, and then Greg's going to take the other one. So let's see, Juan Carlos has a question for Carly. And he says, where is the anorthosite distributed? In the impact craters or on the land with no craters? And then he says, I mean the 2% detected. Um, A little of both impact crater central peak, um, as well as the basin rings, the uh, innermost ring is in Oriental. The distribution was first shown by Otaki et al. in the 09 paper and followed up by Yamamoto in uh, 2012. There's a paper that will be coming out in JGR shortly by Cheek et al. on the Oriental ring. Uh, uh, pan, and a paper has just been submitted by Donaldson Hanna to JGR um, on uh, the more thorough overview of where the pan occurs. So keep your eye out for all of those. 
Okay. Great. Thank right. you. Oh, yeah. Uh, Brad has a follow-on comment to that. Yeah, Carly, I was just kind of curious if you could comment on what the uh, presence of this uh, relatively pure anorthosite is with regards to the overall thermal cooling history of, uh, of the crust and whatnot. Well, I was thinking that, too, during some of the presentations today, um, uh, because we, one of the things we've documented very clearly is that not only does, does it exist, but it exists in a very coherent form, and the Oriental is a, a beautiful example of that, that there's this zone of massive anorthosite in the inner Rook uh, Mountains. Uh, um, it's not just a fragment here or a fragment there. It's a large, coherent zone of anorthosite and pure anorthosite. Now, OK, that's one question answered, but more questions asked. And the whole thermal environment, uh, what does that mean for the magma ocean? How do you do that in the magma ocean? Clearly, there are still fans, uh, but there are pans now, and we have to accommodate both of those. So one question answered, another question raised. <laughs> okay. Well, we have science. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, we have another question. Another question. Yeah, this one's from Clive for Jim. Um, do you think that the bottom-up approach forges science engineering synergies, and the top-down approach works against it? Well, I think that uh, in Apollo, which was definitely a top-down approach, we went to the moon not for science, but for international pride and prestige and leadership. Uh, it worked really well. It, the first thing was to get the human to the moon and return them safely, but even before Apollo 11 was successful, the engineers were thinking about what to do beyond, and we worked very hard to build that bond that just paid off in spades from Apollo 12 on. So it can work very well from a top-down point of view, but in the intervening period, when you don't have a top-down view that is directly related to the short-term goals, like, for example, landing on the moon with humans, et cetera, it's really important to have the bottom-up approach so that you're really ready to go when the time comes, and the time will definitely come, okay, when we're heading back to the moon uh, with humans and a very well integrated uh, national and international space program. So I think both can work. Sometimes uh, in the case of, uh, I would just say constellation, I think when there was a national goal, a top-down sort of thing, I think the engineers uh, and some leadership um, felt they had their marching orders and it was less important to sit down with a scientist and figure out what was really needed. So I think if we'd gone on with that over a longer period of time, we probably would have been as successful in science and engineering synergism too. But I think if we plant the seeds now and cultivate them from the point of view of the bottom-up approach with getting together with the engineers, uh, then it will work very well that way. Okay, and we have a, a comment from the Washington University in St. Louis group. And they say, the younger generation would love to have their own Apollo, but we need more funding and in-person conferences so that we can plant seeds and network. <laughs> and uh, we would just like to say that we completely agree with that. As wonderful as this has been, we do miss dearly having the in-person conference where we got to interact with all of you. And uh, I yes. especially hurt, and I know Greg does too, for the young people who get, get so much out of that. Uh, but I really appreciate appreciate how everybody's just jumped forward and tried to, to make the best out of this. I think this is far better than having no conference at all. And uh, it had a, a lot of um, attributes to it that I think none of us expected to see. Yeah. So um, yeah. 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 That's right. That's so. right. So we're very much in, in sympathy with with that. When we were preparing for this, I think that the younger generation, this was um, kind of the hardest thing, you know, that we uh, for yeah. us that we, you know, for students, this is just an incredible opportunity to interact with, uh, you know, potential mentors, um, you know, other other partners and everything and um, and so you know so we're dealing with a situation here where we're, we're going to continue to see a lot of these virtual events okay. what we're going to do is push for these um, in-person in -person conferences um, but we're also going to try to improve the way we do That's virtual right. things to uh, get pe give people the networking opportunities that's right right so uh, and, and no one cares about uh, students any more than, uh, than you guys, Jim and Carly. I've seen it. I've been to Brown. I've seen what you do with those students, and, and it's really magnificent. Uh, I think all of our teams have really cared a lot about students, and we've, we've been so fortunate to watch what they've done over the last uh, few years with NLSI. 
uh, it's, it's really touching. And those students have gone on to carry that message. And I'm sure people across the nation have done the same thing with their students. We've just been fortunate enough to see those up close. So, um, yeah. so anyhow, thank you so much for your talk today. And I think uh, now.